This is episode number 43 of DevOps Paradox with Darren Pope and Victor Farsik. I am Darren. And I am Victor. And Victor has a new microphone. <laughs> he's, pro- he's probably sounding better right now. It's much easier because he likes to get... How much... How, so when you travel... Let me, we've never talked about this. So when you travel... Actually, let me put it this way. When I travel, I have a massive bag and I carry lots of stuff. Just because I'm usually there for a week and trying to maintain some normalcy. You, on the other hand, more times than not, are not somewhere for a week. Yes, sometimes, yes. I mean, this time, for example, I'm out for 10 days. Uh, but I'm a I'm very unorganized person. I just put random stuff in a suitcase and then figure out what I need and buy it. On, and buy it when you need it. Okay. When, when I need it, yes. See, I couldn't do that. Except for the one time my bag was lost. Okay, so in my case, I don't remember the last time I actually bought any clothes outside of airports. It's been years, I think. Oh, that's a sad thing because that's a captive audience. But but this story sort of weaves into what we're going to talk about today. Maybe. I want to make it I'm going to make it weave into it. Uh testing. Now we had a, a recent episode with Eric Mizell about his concept of continuous reliability. We're going to take that one step further and we'll see if continuous testing is a thing, what do you think? It's not. That's it. That's the whole conversation. It's not. <laughs> Why do people think it is? Or okay, so so let's define what we think continuous testing is before we go any further. I cannot imagine what it actually really is outside of uh, silly uh, marketing uh, from companies. Because l- l- what I've been asked quite a few times, okay, so Victor, you're going to help us with continuous delivery. And I said, yes, I'm going to help you with continuous delivery. They say, but can you can you then join that with continuous testing? And then my eyes start rolling around and I lose a bit of my hair because I cannot understand what would be continuous testing together outside, inside, I don't even know, but in conjunction with continuous delivery. Does that mean that you're doing continuous integration, continuous delivery, whatever continues without testing, and then you need to add continuous testing to it? Is that what it means? Does it mean that continuous delivery means that you're going to build something and deploy it, and then separately from all that test, maybe? Or if you don't have continuous delivery, then we're just going to deploy stuff automatically without testing. Well, what, what can it be? I, I, I really don't know. Is it just because they they need to be on the continuous bandwagon? Because it's, I think that the world continues like together with DevOps sells well, and then uh, companies invent continuous something, and I don't understand what that continuous something is. Can we agree right now that continuous delivery would mean that you are continuously delivering something somewhere, and that you are not doing in your, s- unless you're completely insane, all that without testing? Can we agree on that? I can agree. On, I can agree with you on that. I can also tell you in reality it doesn't happen. Yeah, no, no. In reality, reality is is I, I I have difficulty coping with reality. But logically speaking, continuous delivery includes testing, right? Yes. So what is continuous testing then? It's something made up. <laughs> it's it's the same thing when people ask me. Okay, uh, we want both CI and CD. No, CI is is a subset of CD. And uh, testing is subset of CD. And building is subset of CD. And deploying is subset of CD. So there is no, if you're doing continuous delivery, there is no such thing as continuous building, continuous testing, continuous uh, coffee making, whatever it is. It's all part of a process. Now, my theory is that because still companies live in a highly separated, uh, with highly separated departments. And then, yeah, oh, we are a testing department. We don't do whatever uh, the others are doing. We don't cooperate with others. We don't work with others. They have something called continuous delivery. We are not included because we exclude ourselves. And then we need to come up with something that's going to be continuous delivery. Uh, sorry, continuous testing. That's, that's the only thing that I can imagine can be happening. And it's just a sign of companies not understanding that there is no continuous anything without different experts working together. Well, it's continuous 
also implies to me that you've eliminated manual gates as much as possible. Yeah, there is no continuous with gates. That's probably the most inflammatory statement you've ever said. Say it again, because that's an important phrase. There is no continuous something if there are gates, simply because gates means I stop, I wait until somebody approves it, and then I continue. Logically speaking, I'm not talking about how a company is implemented, but logically speaking, if you need to stop and wait for some unknown amount of time until somebody approves something, then it's not continuous. And I'm going to coin a new phrase right now that probably does not exist in industry. It's a delayed delivery, right? It's simply, it's, it's logic. It's nothing to do with tooling. Forget about tools. You cannot say that you're continuously doing something if a significant part of that something, you're waiting for something to happen. Okay. We're, 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 we're hammering hard on the people that are delusional right now. Yes. Yes. If you're delusional, then uh, I think that this is a wrong podcast for you. Uh, there are many people who can do real professional uh, assistance. <laughs> Let's go to the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. What if people do not believe that they can automate their test at all? They said it's too complex. A human has to do their testing. That's better. That's bad, but that's better than the situation where they're fooling themselves that they're doing some automation just for the sake of fooling themselves and they're not, which is a very common case. You know, when, when, when you write a bunch of tests and then they're failing, 20% of them are failing and you still have a month of manual testing afterwards. That's fooling yourself. I would be actually happier if, if that group of people would say, okay, no automation. We're not capable of it. It's admitting something and that's, that's good. That's not bad. Admitting that you cannot do something is not a bad thing. There are many things that I cannot do and admit. I cannot dance. And I don't dance because I cannot dance. I admitted it. But do you want to dance? No. that's separate. You can dance if you want to. You can leave your friends behind. Yeah. Fortunately for me, I don't want to dance. But if I would want to dance, I would still admit I don't know how to dance because uh, my feet don't, are not controllable, uh, which is a separate subject. But... Admitting, eh? actually, in many cases, it, it's not only admitting, it's yes, this is a horrible application that was not designed to be testable, and we are not going to test it automatically. We are going to continue suffering until one day we go bankrupt or we rewrite that application. That's a valid statement. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a known state. Yeah, it's, 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 it's being sincere. It's being accepting the reality. Now, let's back up for just a second. That is that person's current belief. Yes. But what if in reality it could be testable and they're just not aware? I doubt that that, so, uh, that it could be testable and they're not aware that's possible. But if I rephrase your statement and say, what if they are aware that they cannot make it testable? That's quite possible, quite likely. Actually, as a matter of fact, if you were capable of making it testable, then you would have done it so far. So the problem is you. You cannot make it testable. There is nothing wrong with it. I mean, there is something wrong with it, but it's an understanding what you can and what you cannot do. That's the first step, because the next step is once you admit that, okay, so we need to bring somebody who can help us with that, who can explain us how to do it, who can teach us, who can maybe even rewrite our application. Many options. But the first step is like uh, being an alcoholic, the first step is to, to stop being alcoholic is to admit that you're an alcoholic, right? I'm guessing. I'm not, but I've, I've seen it in movies. Uh, okay, yes, I'm, I'm going to go there. Um, <laughs> the I want I want to go back to the bomb you just dropped about delayed delivery. Yes, that's a that's the common pattern in most companies. So. If people are fooling themselves, thinking they're doing any kind of CX, we'll just say it that way, but in really they're do, in reality they're doing DX, delay, delayed everything. What there, there there's a, a a lack of knowing how to admit you have a problem. Yeah, you're fooling yourself that you're doing something that you're not doing, and that's that prevents you from solving the problem. 
my, maybe the problem cannot be solved. Maybe it can, but it will never be solved if you're... So if the, let's say that the solution to your problems would be to uh, do continuous delivery, just for the sake of argument. There can be many different solutions. If that's a solution, you're never going to apply that solution because you're fooling yourself that you're already doing that. So therefore, that cannot be a solution, right? That's correct. I'm into philosophical mood right now, but if you, if you claim that you're doing something, then that's some, and you're actually not, but you are claiming that you are, then that something is off the table as a solution. Well, it's it's Yoda. Yeah. Do or do not. There is no try. Exactly. I probably butchered it. So people don't want to automate their tests because they can't. That's one thing. If people don't want to automate their tests because they're saying, I don't want to do it. I know how to do it. I just don't want to. That's being... That being a liar. That's what it is. Because there is no person who says, uh, who truly knows how to do something in, that is better than something else. And at the same time says, I'm not going to do it. That would be the same thing as, I don't know, uh, me saying, I know how to code in Go, but I'm not going to do it because I prefer to code in Perl. I mean, I most likely don't know how to code in Go. I mean, I'm using, now I'm not comparing the two. That's a bad, That's not what I want to do. But uh, when they say I know, they don't. If we're trying to help people make a decision, change their mindset, where should they start? If they're not doing any kind of testing today at all, and it is something that could be testable, where should they start? Obviously, unit test would be the right place to start, right? If nothing else. I think that they should, if people are just starting, they should definitely, without any doubt, they should not start with any of their applications because uh, that's going to be very hard and the lessons learned are going to be bad and so on and so forth. S create a new application. Uh, there is always something new happening in a company. Find something that is being created new where you can start without the pain that will be inflicted if you start trying that something in an existing application that is not designed for that something. So start a new application. If there is no such thing as new application in your company, start your own pet, pet project. Uh, if Do it in work office hours. If you cannot do it in office hours, do it outside office hours. Figure out how to find the use case where you can apply that something, be it testing or something else that is not on your existing application because you're going to suffer through problems before and and it's okay to suffer through problems when you're experienced how to how to know where to look for solutions but if you have no experience and then you're thrown into so solving difficult problems that might not be easy or solvable at all then you're in a bad place i was thinking i was saying unit tasks may be a good place to start actually if you got a web-based application maybe that's the worst place to start just automate the click-throughs of the ui if nothing else yeah, something, but th th that's also problematic. That's why I think that, you know, if if you start from, uh, I think that you should start from your uh, unit tests actually, uh, because that will drive the design of your application. Uh, otherwise, you're going to, if you start with clicking UI, then you're going to exaggerate in the amount of tests. You're going to cr you're going to start testing things that shouldn't be testable in that way. Uh, you're going to create yet another technical debt and you're going to wonder why it takes you weeks to write new tests and why it takes hours or days to execute them. Uh, at, at least that's my experience. Uh, when people, those that I've seen that start from there, they simply think that uh, that's the way how you should do all your testing and it's not. Let's go back to what you were talking about, going to create a new application mm -hmm. instead of working on your... Now, if your application is small, you're writing a microservice, then okay, there's no excuse. Do it there. Yeah. But, but most people don't really write microservices when it's all said and done. Most. Look, when you start a new application, it's a microservice no matter what. That's correct. Because it's new and it doesn't have much in it. So it's going to be small. I'll, I mean, unless you're a, I don't know, Superman or something and you can start and write hundreds of thousands of lines first day. And that's the right place to go ahead and get... Your, all your continuous stuff done. You've got you've got the bones in place. You did. Let's say you're using Spring Framework or Spring Boot. You crank up the, just a little Spring Boot app with the the packaging in it that you need. The very first thing, don't write real code. 
figure out how to get that thing shipped. Just like get it out where it's going to be running or at least a prototype of where it's running. Exactly. And once you know that you've proven that out, your chances of being able to be continuous are probably much greater. I'm not going to put a number on it because you've already proven out. Oh, I can do my code. I can commit. My hooks are good. Uh, the, the deploy side of it, the testing side of it is all working. You, you keep working. You, you, you start rolling in tests before you start writing real code. Where if you need to do integration testing, if you need to do database evolutions, maybe those are the first things you're putting in because those, those are your foundational things. And then three weeks later, whatever, however long it takes you to get there, you start writing the real code. Exactly. Because then you have a good foundation to build on. And that's not really what you just said is completely correct. And it's not related directly with testing that applies to anything else. Let's say that you want to change the database your, your application is using and you have zero experience, no experience. Are you going to start rewriting everything to use that database without having any experience or to change framework in your application or anything? First, you get experience up to a certain level and then you start modifying real deal. Well, and then, then you know how to test. You have to have experience before you can test it. Yeah. If nothing else, once you get bit of experience, you will be able to say, not worth it, not worth it. Yeah, I'm going to do that part. It's just when you have the blinders on, it's like, here's my JIRA ticket. This is what I do. Yeah. It, it's just, it's a lost cause at that point. But th that's kind of one of the problems. It always sounds as if it's going to be more efficient, not wasting time on something that goes to trash and starting, and starting from day one on the real deal, as if that's going to take you somewhere faster. And I think that that's completely wrong. First, you learn things on something that goes to trash, and then you apply it, and you're going to get there faster for sure, 100% sure. Well, so there's there's a guy I listen to, Ken Coleman. I've talked, to him, talked about him a couple of times. One of his phrases is, relentless preparation... I'll throw in the word practice there. So relent relentless practice turns into reflexive performance. I like it. If, if you keep practicing at some point, it's just natural. That's the reason why you see sports teams. It's like, why are they just doing this one thing over and over again? Because in the heat of pressure, when that same scenario occurs or a, a variation of that scenario occurs, the reflexes kick in and it's like, oh, this is how we solve it. Firemen, you know, first responders, all those, they work in the same way. Why not apply that same concept to what we do as a knowledge worker? We practice. It's like, oh, okay, I, I did this. Okay, this time I'm going to Heroku. Okay, this time I'm going to build something that goes into EKS. This time I'm doing whatever it is, right? I'm just building up these small things. This follows, you know, nothing, nothing against your programming skills, Victor, but, uh, your classes and your books, those aren't full applications. No. But what, but what they are, are practice. Of course. And by drilling that practice, it's not about the code, it's about everything else. That's actually a good example. If, if, if I start to, let's say a book about, about Kubernetes, aiming, uh, aimed at people who know nothing about Kubernetes. And then we start with a complex scenario that uh, requires some stuff that many people don't need and you and those that do really need it only after years of experience would you start with that a book okay. let's 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 go with a real one hey here, this is this is the introduction to kubernetes uh we're going to be cover uh by the time you get to the end of this book you're going to be able to run a uh multi-region multi-provider cluster with a single application right no that's it's like, why, why do that? Number one, most people will never need that. Most. There may be a handful of people in the whole world that would need that level of whatever. What you're going to get down to the end is, can I, can I deploy my application? Can I see the failovers? Do I understand the concepts of deployment versus stateful set? Because all, the, all those, are, those are fundamentals before you can even get to the multi-cluster, multi-region. Exactly. I mean, the end could be what, what you just said, multi-cluster, multi-region. That could be the end goal uh, of 
a book or a third book doesn't matter. End goal of something, but you don't start there. No matter what's the end goal, that's not the start. Correct. But testing is always an interesting, interesting subject. Let's one thing we haven't touched on. I'm going to step into it with both feet. What do you think of test-driven development in the way that it's preached today? Uh, now, in the way that it's preached, that's hard because different people preach different stuff and ways to do that. But I do believe in test-driven development being the only viable way to do development. What's your definition of test-driven development? You write a test, you execute it, it fails. You write some code, you execute the test, and it succeeds. Simple. Okay. I had to ask because, as you said, it depends on who you're listening to. You know, those can be different levels. That test might require me to write a few lines of code. It can be unit test. It can be a big functional test that requires days of my work. Uh, but if I don't write the test first, I don't know whether that test is valid at all because it might be passing anyways, right? Uh, and it will, it will adjust. It, 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 if, if test is written after the code, then it is bi too biased, right? You're going to go through the code and says, okay, so the code says X should be Y, therefore my test should vali validate whether X should Y. To me, tests are requirements. And uh, forget about even running them. You write the requirement first, and then you make the application pass that requirement. The only thing I'm suggesting is for that requirement to be executable. That's the only difference between what I'm saying and what people have been doing for a long time, period of time. Which is writing Word documents Yeah. That, that aren't executable. Exactly. So I want executable documentation. Think of it that way. Forget about the word test. Okay. You've come up with um, two phrases. One you just dropped, too. Uh, delayed delivery. <laughs> we'll probably get a lot of hate mail on that, but that's okay. At least we'll get some more. And then this last one, executable documentation. Is that what you said? Yes, executable documentation. Written before, not after uh, the subject that it is being documented. That's, what else can you say? Without, without clear requirements, without, I'm not going to say documentation, but without clear requirements, why are you writing an application? Now, clear meaning 80% clear, because some things you won't know until you get into it. No, or it can be, yeah, eighty percent. It can be ninety-nine. It can be hundred percent. Where where I where I disagree with how we were doing in the past is that I don't believe that requirements should be write, written months in advance. It can be I'm going to write a requirement for a thing, a single thing that I'm going to about to start implementing. That's okay, and those requirements can change. That's also okay. I just want them to be executable. I just want them to written, be written in advance to confirm that that requirement is not fulfilled and then you to fulfill that requirement and confirm that requirement is fulfilled. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one more statement here and then we'll, we'll wrap. But I want to see what your response is to this. Most people that write requirements primarily are not technical. And the, the skill gap between those people the the skill gap is those people do not have the ability to write executable requirements how do we help that stop not knowing uh, anything about the industry you're working in Th that that would be unacceptable anywhere else why is it acceptable in software i don't understand can you work in a hospital without knowing anything about medicine if you're the janitor yes even even the janitor knows the 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 hazmat bags. Yeah, and probably knows what to throw to trash and what not. Uh, but uh, I'm not talking about. Uh, so one thing is to work in an industry and do a job that is unrelated with what that industry does. That's okay, janitor. That's 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 cool. But in affecting directly the outcomes of that industry without knowing what that industry is. 
that's insanity. That's crazy. Whether you're a nurse, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a radiology tech, all of you have had biology. Yeah. And you might, now, now there are different levels of experience. I'm not asking everybody to be the best coder in the world. I'm not asking that from anybody. I'm not asking that even from, from developers. But to have certain level of understanding, ah, oh, come on. It's a must. And if you're not willing to keep learning, pilots have to go back for recurring training. Or at least, okay, let me rephrase it. Okay, you don't understand what what's it all about. You don't have capabilities to contribute to that. Then actually limit your work to the to the absolute minimum possible. So if you're deci- defining requirements, great. Talk with the, the team about those requirements, but don't be the one who defines them. Defines them. This, explain. You know, I think that people would like uh, red color. Excellent. And then let somebody else define really what that means. You have the visionary person, and then you have the impl- the translator person that is able to get it to the implementer. Yeah. And that's okay. Well, dang, we didn't fight enough on that one. Um, mm-hmm. That's okay. <laughs> This testing is always a very touchy subject because I don't see it done. Number one, I don't see it done very much. And most of the time when I do see it done, it is done very poorly. Exactly. But nobody today denies the benefits of having automated, automating repetitive tasks. No sane person, sane person def- denies that. It's only they, about... They, they may not deny it, but they actually don't do it. Yeah, they don't do it, or they cannot do it, or uh, there, there are many reasons why it's not happening. But, you know, it's repetitively automated. Outside of software industry, it's already automated, so why not our industry? I can go to McDonald's. I don't even have to talk to a person anymore. In fact, I can make my order, drive up to the McDonald's, somebody hands me the bag, off I go. Exactly. I don't have to talk to anybody to place the order. I can customize it the way I want. The automation is getting rid of the frontline things. Who is the frontline people in our industry? Everybody. Everybody. Well, to me, it's everybody. But the front, to me, the frontline people are going to be the testers. They're usually the most junior to come in on a team. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I mean, sorry, most of the time they are, but they shouldn't be. That's another one of the things. It's kind of testing is not a stepping stone towards something better. It's not, why would you be junior? You should be experienced test coder that actually knows how to write tests and help others who don't. But if you're a tester listening to this today, and you're like, well, I don't know how to do that. Go figure it out. There's this thing called the Google. <laughs> Go ask the Google. And shameless plug, Victor has books and courses. Um to help think. I mean, and there's plenty of people that do. That's, we're just sort of joking there, but not really. The go learn. If you're unwilling to better yourself in your role, go find another job. Yeah. And let me just clarify. Now we were talking about testers, but exactly the same applies to any other segment of our industry. So if you're offended because you're listening to this and you're a tester, then well, Applies to developers, applies to architects, applies to everybody. It's always interesting to go into places that on, on, on what I talk about, and then I introduce Cobra, and especially since people, oh yeah, we're starting to do some stuff and go just, well, I say, have you looked at Cobra yet? No, what's Cobra? Oh dear. Right. And Co- which if you don't know what Cobra is, it's fine. I'm not throwing, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything, but Cobra is the framework that is used to build CLIs and go cube cuddles built on it. Hugo, you name, you go out to the Cobra, just go get it and look for Cobra on GitHub. Did I just make up a new verb? Get it. <laughs> um, the, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things. So you have to always be learning. If you don't want to be, if you don't want to continue learning to me, you have two options, maybe more, but two obvious options to me. One is retire. Just get out of the way so somebody else can take your seat. Or number two, if, if you don't want to learn, 
go find a, a role that doesn't require you to have to learn. But in our, in, in our industry and in what we do, you have to be learning period. And like we learned today, Mr. Farsick, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Farsick gave us two really great phrases to think about delayed delivery. And I'm going to call it executable requirements or executable documentation, whichever we want to call it. And also removed one word from your vocabulary, continuous testing. That is correct. All right. Very interesting conversation. I'm still waking up and trying to grok all this. I think I agree with most of it. I'll have to listen to it when I edit it to see if I still agree with it or not. But if you are listening right now via Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please subscribe, leave a rating review. All of our contact information, including Twitter and LinkedIn, can be found at devopsparadox.com slash contact. And if you would like to be notified by email when a new episode is released, you can sign up at devopsparadox.com. The sign-up form is at the top of every page. And I believe that's truly every page now. Uh, also, if you're wanting, uh, down in the show notes, we'll have some links out to other things. Oh, by the way, by the way, here, fill some, fill some time for me, Victor, quick. Hello, my name is Victor. How are you today? <laughs> Okay, keep going. I'm almost there. No, no. You cut it. <laughs> okay, later. I'm there. I'm there. I, yeah, no, nah, that's that's staying in. That's that's classic. Okay, so we got a recent review uh, on uh, Apple Podcast from Folk Engine, and uh, let me let me read that just in case you you know, it's, it's it was great. It says, as a developer who is finally embracing the harmonic convergence. These are great words that is happening between development operations and quality. This has quickly become my favorite technical podcast, a wonderful, wonderful companion to Victor Farsik's excellent books and video training courses. I love how they embrace and dive into the ambiguity of the DevOps craft. Highly recommended folk engine. Thanks for the review and the five star rating. See, no. you as a listener can do the same thing. You can leave a rating and a review. Now, Folk Engine, you were using some really big words there. Harmonic convergence. Wow. That's too much for me. I I wish there was harmonic convergence between development and operations and quality at most places. It's more like cognitive dissonance more than anything else than harmonic convergence. But anyway, testing. Do it. Do it right. If you've never done it before, start small. Once you start small, you grow steady. Just little by little. Little bits here and there. Now right now, today is someday. I don't even know what today is on the release date. Today's release date is... I should always write this down like a doofus and I forgot. Um, today is February 19th if you're listening on the release day. Victor, you're probably somewhere... I know. Oh, I know, I know exactly where we are today. We're actually physically sitting side by side. Oh, we're in Vegas. We're in Vegas. Yeah, baby. And this is not Vegas. Is not my favorite place in the world. It's the only. It's one of the few cities you can go from the airport, get in a cab, go to your hotel, stay there for fifteen days, never come out of the hotel, get back in the cab, and go to the airport. It's not one of my pleasant, most pleasant places to go. But yeah, we're actually physically together. So during this week, we are recording hopefully a few more episodes just because we'll be face to face and whatever it is. But anyway, is that it? Anything else about testing for today? Learn it, apply it just like anything else. That's it. That's it. Thanks for listening to episode 43 of DevOps Paradox.